Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank, my name is Kathy Bryla. Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, uh, Native Plants for a Traditional Landscape. Some of you who have been to our webinars in the past have had the amazing pleasure of seeing me before. Um, but tonight you're going to have a special treat, and I'm going to have a special treat. This is the first presentation that I am going to be um, co-presenting with a new team leader for SAG Moraine that we are so amazingly happy to have on board. Uh, she is Shamim Graf, and Shamim is our new interpretive outreach director and librarian. So she is a well, Shamim is a wealth of knowledge on native plants and our local ecosystem and our environment. And, and we're just so happy to have her on board. And I'm so happy to be presenting with her tonight. Hello, Shamim, say hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> So we are, as I said, presenting Native Plants for a Traditional Landscape, and um, I'm going to start out, for those of you who haven't uh, been with us before, talking a little bit about what, what SAG Moraine does, who we are, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, why planting Native is so important, but then we're going to get down to the meat of the matter, and we're going to be talking specifically, doing a deep dive into some Native plants that are that will work well in smaller urban and suburban landscapes. Even though we we at Sag Moraine we love all native plants and all native plants are beautiful in their own way. Some, however, may not be everyone's taste for a traditional suburban or a smaller urban or suburban landscape. And so what we want to do is showcase some that will look lovely in your yard, no matter what size your yard or, or even front yard is. And with that, I, I would like to, let me see, I wanted to also, uh, so bear with me because I also want to show you guys something. This isn't necessarily the most professional thing that I would do. I would leave my PowerPoint on and we'd be all good and safe. But I really want to share with you a new tool that we have on our website because the, the plants that we're going over tonight, um, we're, we're give, giving some of our favorites and some of the, you know, the best ones for your landscape. But we also... And I'll show you later. I don't want to mess up my screen. Anyway, I also, you know what, we have the link in the chat. I don't have to show you. We have a new tool on our website um, that just came on this spring, um, and it is our new native plant selector. And the link is in the chat. And what we did with that native plant selector, it's not, it's not, um, all encompassing of all plants that are native to our area in Illinois. What we did is we vetted native plants um, as to what ones are conducive, appropriate for smaller urban and suburban landscapes. So it takes the guesswork out of um, trying to choose native plants for people who are wanting to plant them in their home or business landscape. So if you're looking to, to plant native, that native plant selector is a great way to start. None of the plants on the plant selector are going to uh, spread and take over your whole property. None of them are 10 feet tall. Um, so uh, please check that out. And we hope that that will be a great resource for you during this planting season. Um, but the ones, but then we are going to be doing a deep dive tonight on some specific native plants that are some of um, the most beautiful and um, nicest to work with in, in a suburban landscape. So with that, we at SAG Moraine, as you can see on the slide, our motto is restoring our environment one plant at a time. And the reason why we we like that motto so much is because we truly believe that every plant counts. So whether you put in a little six by six pollinator garden or plant a, a native shrub in, in the back corner of your yard or plant a native tree in your parkway, even, even a container with native plants, all of this can make a big difference uh, to our local ecosystem. SAG Moraine is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit environmental organization in the near west and southwest suburbs.
And our mission is to restore native plants to our residential, business, and public landscapes through community outreach and education. And Shamim will soon be doing some um, explaining as to why we think this mission is so important and why we hope you will think this mission is important as well. Our beliefs, we believe that native plants are the foundation of our food chain and must become more widely utilized to improve the ecosystems that sustain all life. And we believe it, so therefore it's true, so you should believe it too. Just kidding. But you should believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and what we do, oh, we're such a fun group, we do a lot. So um, we do in-person and online learning opportunities such as this, and we do a lot of um, learning opportunities out in the community too, speaking at I mean, park districts and libraries and uh, community events and uh, for clubs and for municipalities. So we're out and about a lot. Uh, by doing that, we, we engage in a lot of community outreach, trying to spread the, the word about the importance of native plants. We assist people in obtaining and selecting native plants, and we do that uh, largely through our new native plant selector and our upcoming native plant sale. Uh, we're committed to trying to make native plants uh, more readily available to these near west and southwest suburbs and affordable. Uh, we do garden projects, sponsorship and oversight. We do nature appreciation experiences for both children and adults. We've recently started, launched our youth education program. So we're very excited about that. And because we're such a fun group to hang out with, we also do some purely social activities um, having to do with nature. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Shamim for a while. Let her rip, Shamim. <laughs> so before we actually get to those uh, lovely plant pictures, um, and you can start making your wish list, we wanted to just take a minute and talk about why it is that we think this is so important. Um, so if you've gotten to see the prequel to um, this webinar, um, Restoring Our Environment One Plant at a Time, this is going to be a refresher for you, but if you haven't, um, we just put the link in the chat. Thanks, Mary. Um, and you definitely should check that out after this talk. So we're just going to do a quick little overview. So native plants are the foundation of a healthy ecosystem. But what's an ecosystem? Um, it's a geographic area where plants, animals, organisms, and weather interconnect. And so you think about these systems that have evolved and formed over thousands of years. And where we sit right now, um, for most of us doing this webinar, that ecosystem was a prairie. Sorry, I did that by accident. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that ecosystem creates these great habitats for all of the animals, plants, all the organisms that live in that area. And we can have large scale habitats and little teeny micro habitats. Um, for all kinds of things. Uh, so native plants, um, people often ask what makes a plant native. And it's one of those plants that has been here for that long haul that over hundreds, thousands of years have evolved and developed in conjunction with all of the other um, animals, insects, everything living in that environment. A non-native plant is one that, that we ourselves have introduced to this area, whether intentionally or accidentally, um, that didn't used to be here. And a weed is just quite simply a plant that's not valued where it is. Um, that can be a native plant, it can be a non-native plant. It's just simply one that we don't want where it is. Now, most of our weeds that we think of, like dandelions, uh, some of our clovers, things like that, they are not native. So why is that important? Well, our insect populations, our bird populations are, they're not doing great. 25% <laughs> um, of our native bee species are at risk of extinction. 
Um, and we're not talking about those European honeybees, we're talking about like our mason bees and uh, some of the other bumblebees, some of the other species that live here. A lot of people know the monarch butterfly, uh, it's here in this photo. Um, the populations have decreased by more than 95% in recent decades. Now that number has gone up and down depending on the season, but where we're at is a really important place for monarchs in their flyaway and their migration to Mexico. And the more um, butterflies that can start that trip, that means the more butterflies that will make that whole migration down to Mexico and back. And we'll talk a little bit later about what we can do. There's a, a few things that you can do to help them specifically. Um, but just in general, insect populations have dropped and you know, very closely tied to that, so are bird populations. And because what do birds eat? A lot of them eat insects. And also, <laughs> those insects need some place to live, right? So if we don't have the, the native plants, the foods that they've evolved to eat, they're not going to be here. They have no place to survive. And if they're not here, then the birds aren't here either. So it's all connected. So there's a lot of, um, you know, like I said, everything has co-evolved together. There's a lot of um, pollinators that their larva can only feed on very specific native plants. Um, in the case of, you know, the monarch butterfly, that's milkweeds. Um, a butterfly could lay an egg on a different plant, but they're not going to because that caterpillar isn't going to be able to eat that food and grow up into a butterfly. Um, that caterpillar needs the nutrients it finds in the milkweed plant and really only the milkweed plant. Um, some pollinators are really specific. Some are a bit more generalist in what they're able to eat, but if we aren't providing those native plants, they're not getting that food. And so it just continues up the chain, you know, that the nectar, the pollen that they can get um, keeps them, you know, able to reproduce. Um, some are able to get foods from non-native plants, but at the end of the day, the ones that they have evolved with are the ones that they get the best nutrition and energy from. And if you're sitting there wondering, why do we care about the insects and birds? Well, we need those pollinators. Uh, pollinators are responsible for pollinating more than 150 different food crops in the U.S. Um, if we didn't have pollinators, we wouldn't have plants that kept reproducing, and we know we need those plants to produce oxygen. The plants also sequester carbon, especially our prairie plants, and there are huge, huge root systems that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, in places where there are no plants, you can see the runoff when it, we've got heavy rains, um, but those root systems and those plants help um, filter our water and keep erosion from happening. And also through their processes, they return moisture back into our atmosphere. So they do a whole lot for us. And, you know, a lot of times we don't really give them a second thought. And birds need those plants too. So like I said earlier, um, there's a lot of birds that feed on insects. Caterpillars are like not just a delicacy, but really it's, it's fundamental for birds to grow up. Um, I think Kathy, you were you had run across the statistic about just how many caterpillars it takes to feed a single brood. Mm -hmm. It was like 9,000. And that's according to Doug Tallamy, who's an entomologist at 9,000. It, it's huge numbers. I mean, just think about where are they getting all of those caterpillars from as you look around your, your neighborhood. Um, but native plants also provide seed and often um, throughout the year, um, even into the winter. And birds need a place to raise those little ones. And so, you know, those nesting locations to give them shelter, all of that's so important. And all of it is best done with our native plants. And I know this all seems a little depressing. Don't worry, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just like the insects, we need our birds too. Um, birds are great at controlling agricultural pests. Um, they too are important pollinators for a lot of our plants. Um, some birds also help, um, you know, keep the spread of disease down and uh, take care of waste removal for us. I mean, just think about what the vultures do for us, just themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 
they also help um, not just pollinate, but also to spread seed and continue to build our ecosystems. And, you know, without them, you know, they're just such an integral part with it of the whole system. You know, we, we wouldn't have all of this without birds. But the good news is it's we can do something. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is. I mean, I know we sound like a really fun group that just love to talk about positive, fun things, but truly we do want to bring a positive message tonight because um, this is something that that all of us can, can change, that we, we can all make a difference. Anybody who owns land or has influence over land can make a difference simply by adding some native plants. And that's really not... Um, you know, too hard of a thing to take either because native plants have an amazing amount of attributes. Native plants are beautiful, as you're going to see tonight. Some of the photos we're going to show you, they they sell themselves. We don't even really have to say anything. Um, native plants require less watering once they're established. As Shami mentioned, their roots run very deep. And uh, so once you give them a year or two to establish that root system, um, their need for water, unless they are a wetland plant designed to be in wet areas. Um, but the majority of our prairie native plants will need very little water once those roots are established. Our native plants are well suited to our climate and our soil. Yes, they love our crappy clay soil. They love, love, love it. And because they love, love, love it just the way it is, they don't ever need to be fertilized. In fact, if you fertilize them, they'll probably fall over. Here's a, here's a photo of some of those root systems. And you'll see that of our native plants, um, a lot of the root systems are two to three times uh, run deeper than the plant itself. So whatever you're seeing above ground, think two to three times below ground. That's a, a long way that they can reach down even in periods of drought to, um, to reach water. And if you look over to the far left, I don't know if you saw this, this is lawn. That's why, look at those little lawn roots. That's why you have to water this, your lawn, multiple times a week to have a nice green lawn in, in the heat of the summer. Okay, so now we're going to start actually talking about some of the, the best native plants for your suburban landscape. Feel free to do some, to take some screenshots if you want to remember some of these plants for later um, or look some of them up on our native plant selector or what have you. Or if you have pad and paper in front of you, I would recommend, you know, write some stuff down. This might not be the, the juiciest. We're going to kind of, like I said, do some, do a deep dive into some very specific native plants that you might be interested in for your area. And I do want to mention before we get to our first plant is it, it has been shown, researchers say that it's always better to go with the straight species versus a cultivar. So we basically, if you go into your garden centers or your nurseries, you're going to either find imported plants. These are plants that never have, never will be um, native to this area. They came from Europe, they came from Asia. Then you'll find what are called cultivars. And there are cult, which are plants that have been modified, genetically modified for certain attributes. Now they do do cultivars of native plants with which some people nickname nativars. And probably, in my guess, a nativar would be better than a completely non-native plant. But that's just my opinion. I really don't don't have any, you know, real hard data on that. But for sure, we know that straight species native plants are by far the best for our pollinators, for our birds, for our ecosystem. They're more readily used by our pollinators and birds. They are healthier for our pollinators and birds. Um, so always try to go with the straight species. And the way you can tell if something is a cultivar or a straight species is on the, on the label. So 
for example, salvia. We have a we have a native salvia, um, and it would just say salvia, and it would have the Latin name. Okay, but if you see this other flashy name in quotations, like you see on here, it says pretty in pink. That's the name of the cultivar. So if there's ever another name in quotations, then you know that this is a cultivar and not a straight species. Okay, on to our lovely native plants. So one of the first one, the first one we're going to start with is this lovely low mounding. Two gets about two feet tall and two feet wide um, native milkweed. So this is one of the plants that is very important for our monarch butterflies. Um, you know, again, like Shamim said, they need milkweed to reproduce. And if we're going to keep them from going extinct, we got to get some milkweed in our on our property. And this is a lovely variety. Um, bright orange, cheerful flowers, very, you know, very showy specimen. And even if you like very neat landscapes, this one would be appropriate for even the front of your house because it stays contained, it stays low, it stays very mounded. So even if you're a fan of a very of structured, uh, very neat landscapes, this one would work for you. It likes dry, well-drained soil. And um, not only the, the monarch, it's going to attract many varieties of, of butterflies. And uh, he also attracts other um, pollinators as well as hummingbirds. And this is a variety that is resistant to deer. Deer and rabbits do not like milkweed. So if you're inundated with, with deer or rabbits, milkweeds are a good choice for you. This is one of my personal favorites. I know you don't, I know that that doesn't necessarily mean anything to you, but I had to put it out there. I love blue false indigo. I think that this is just a lovely plant. Um, it will, it, it, it actually, it comes up from the ground every year, but once it, it establishes that nice root system, it will look like a shrub in your landscape, but it'll be a shrub that dies back each year to the ground. Perfect for a formal garden. Again, this this stays very mounded and it's covered in these beautiful uh, lavender purple flowers in June and July, likes full to part sun, medium moisture. This is um, a caterpillar host plant and loved by pollinators. And this is a keystone plant in our area. And one thing that that you know we didn't mention in this, this we go into more in that that previous presentation that Shimi mentioned. But a keystone plant is one that has an exceptionally high amount of ecosystem value. So if you have a limited amount of space and you want to make the most ecosystem bang for your buck, try to incorporate some keystone plants. There's a whole list of keystone plants on our website if you would like to refer to that. Um, but basically, this is based on how many critters or creatures in our ecosystem does this feed. And if it feeds a lot of caterpillars, then it is considered to be a keystone plant. Okay, black-eyed Susan, such an easy plant to grow. If, if I don't care if you feel that you have a black thumb and you can't grow plants, try black-eyed Susans. This is, you basically, you know, maybe water it a little bit the first year or so, but this is pretty much a plant and leave it plant. Um, with great ecosystem value, it too is a host plant, has a very long bloom season. And look at those gorgeous flowers. They're like a, a big smile. Uh, only gets one to two feet tall, uh, dry to medium soil, um, tracks a whole lot of birds and butterflies. And, and this is one that, you know, it, it's been very interesting as I've incorporated more and more native plants in my garden um, to watch the garden in the winter. You know, we think of gardening as a, a spring, summer, a little bit in the fall event, but to watch the birds feed off of my native plants in the winter is, is just so amazing. And, you know, if you plant native plants, you're going to have birds around even in the, in, in the cold of January. And this is one of the plants that I noticed they especially love the seed heads. If you leave the seed heads on all winter. And the best part is no bird feeders to clean. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, 
lead plant. I just think this is a really cool plant um, and uh, you don't see many of them, but this is one of our original shrubs of the prairie in Illinois. So this is a very ancient historic plant in our area and it's a lovely plant. It has this iridescent gray foliage and it only grows two to three feet tall. It does like full sun, medium to dry soil, and it's extremely long lived. And this too is a butterfly host plant and loved by pollinators. And again, it's a keystone plant in our area. Um, it, it'd be great to see more of these go in because they're so lovely. I don't know why that they, um, you, you just never see them and they're, they're gorgeous. Okay, and one more before I turn it over to Shamim. So this is Prairie Blazing Star. Is it, so my my Zoom thing is covering this up. Does that say Prairie Blazing Star, Shamim? It does. Okay. <laughs> it's covering that up. Okay, so um, this is an iconic native Illinois flower. I mean, look at the beautiful spikes. Pollinators love it. Um, it'll grow three to five feet tall. This one likes... Um, uh, not necessarily the driest of soils. This likes medium to moist soil. And this too is a host plant and attracts tons of pollinators and um, other beneficial insects to your garden. So it's it's just a, a, a gorgeous, joyful plant. And with that, take it away. Yeah, so this is our native foxglove. You've probably seen all kinds of uh, cultivars of foxglove over the years. Um, it's got these beautiful white flowers um, and is, you know, amongst these plants, another one that's not too tall, about two to three feet. Um, it will it will tolerate shade, um, or uh, sorry, part, part sun, a little bit of shade. Um, and of course that full sun, like a lot of our prairie plants love. Um, it does like that, uh, that little bit moisture of a soil, so not too dry, um, but it'll give you these gorgeous blooms in the middle of the summer. And of course, uh, if you're looking to attract some of our native bees, this is a great choice, um, but also hummingbirds and all kinds of other pollinators um, and also host plants. So, and if the deer visit your yard, this is another one to add to your list is a deer resistant plant. Ah, New England Aster. So I'm a little biased. This is one of my favorites and it's one of my uh, late summer favorites. Um, and I love to pair it with golden rods and I've got a few recommendations for those coming up. Um, as you can see, like that purple color is just absolutely stunning. Um, they do grow a little bit taller, so they can grow up to six feet tall, but most of them that I see in this area tend to be a little bit shorter. And you can help that out um, by cutting them back in June, um, you know, ahead of them getting ready to flower. So not only are they gorgeous for us to look at, but they're also really important for um, migrating monarchs um, and, you know, other birds and insects too, um, because they are such a late season um, flowerer. <laughs> they're, they're a great little uh, rest stop on the way to get a bite to eat. So they do like that fold apart sun and that, you know, medium to moist soil. Um, but you can't go wrong with this one. Love those New England asters. Ah, we've got another milkweed. Uh, so swamp milkweed um, is actually one of the favorites of monarch butterflies. Now we should plant all the different milkweeds. Um, so, you know, don't feel like this is the one you have to choose. Um, but this is the one that given the choice, um, monarch butterflies tend to lay their eggs on and have successful um, caterpillars. So it's got these gorgeous little pink flowers. Um, it grows about four feet tall. And like our other milkweeds, it's uh, a summer bloomer. So this one likes conditions that are a little bit wetter. So it's not going to it's not going to do well in those really dry areas, but if you've got a place that tends to be a little bit more wet or doesn't completely dry out uh, right away after a rain, that's a great place to put swamp milkweed. Um, and you'll have lots of other pollinators come visit it too, because who can resist that? This 
And cardinal flower, uh, my goodness, we've got all the showy plants right in a row here. Um, this is a hummingbird magnet. Uh, you think about your hummingbird feeders, like they are trying to look like cardinal flower, um, but you can have it in your yard um, and it will grow actually in a lot of the same places that you can put that swamp milkweed. Um, it also likes those moisture uh, soils. So especially in those places that tend to hang on to water a little bit longer. Um, it'll sell steep, so um, you'll have it coming up uh, year after year. And uh, in addition to the hummingbirds, the butterflies love this too. Um, and it is a host plant for some of our butterflies. So if the New England aster was a little too bright for you, we've got this uh, smooth aster, which as you can see, is just a little bit more pale. Um, it tends to be just a little bit taller, a little bit wider than the New England aster. Um, but, you know, like we said earlier, we've picked plants that tend not to be too aggressive spreaders, and while some asters can be that, this is not one of them. Um, it's, uh, you know, easy to grow. It does like full sun, um, it, but it can handle those soils that are a little bit drier, um, and it is also, you know, that later season that, you know, late summer into fall for blooming. Um, and, you know, like all of these, it, the Polynesian birds love it, um, especially, you know, as they're coming through migrating. So those golden rods I was talking about, these pair lovely with the asters. Um, they bloom around the same time, um, usually not quite so late into the season, um, but these, the gorgeous yellow blooms on these. Um, this one is not a aggressive species of goldenrod. Um, you might see goldenrod in places where it seems to spread. This one's not gonna do that for you. Um, it does like full sun and it does like drier soils. And we're here to dispel the myth. Well, the goldenrod is not the, the reason for your itchy eyes and runny nose in the fall. Uh, that's mostly uh, ragweed. You can blame ragweed. <laughs> Um, but we love our goldenrods. Um, they are a keystone plant. Um, you will see all kinds of pollinators, butterflies, birds, all kinds of insects um, that will come flocking to it. Um, and uh, you know, this is you know another one of those deer-resistant plants, so you can't go wrong there. We saw our uh, prairie blazing star earlier. This is our rough blazing star. You can kind of see in the picture that the flowers are a little bit a little bit different, They're, they they look curly. <laughs> um, it only grows about two to three feet tall. Um, it also likes that full sun and um, can do those those drier soils. Um, it's actually, it does really good um, during those, those drought times. Um, it blooms in late summer and uh, it's also, you know, a favorite of so many different pollinators. Um, I just have to add in here, when you look at these flowers up close, isn't just just amazing the, the beautiful intricacy of them? I love that. I, I joke that, you know, because it, because they bloom during the summer, like, you know, these are like nature's fireworks, all these little pops of flowers coming up the stalks. It's like a work of art. It really is. Oh, you're going to have to take this one, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> so another one of my favorites, and this was a, a favorite of mine before I even was new enough to be planting native, but I knew that I purchased one somewhere and put it in my garden and it was covered with pollinators for months. And not only was it one of the, the longest blooming plants that I had, but it was the one that when this thing was blooming, Everybody was there. This was like the place to be. This was the happening place. And um, so this is Anise Hyssop or Blue Hyssop. Again, I can't stress enough. It's, it has such a, a long bloom season, beautiful purple upright flowers like this. It, it, it's very formed. It doesn't fall over. Um, it is, and, and I'm and the, calling it a pollinator magnet is an understatement. Uh, they love the nectar of this, of this plant. Um, you can also use this as an herb for cooking. If you if you crush the leaves or rub the leaves, it does smell like uh, mint or licorice. I think it smells like licorice. Um, it likes full to part sun, medium to dry soil, and again blooms. You know, July, August, September. Just um, just a lovely, a lovely, amazing plant. Attractive foliage too. Yeah, 
and the birds love the seeds in the in the winter if you leave this the seed heads up love it and um, they love the seed heads of this one anyway go ahead <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely do uh it's no lie like the the goldfinches and other birds will come flocking to this but this is a uh, purple cone flower um echinacea if you've you know seen it in teas and stuff this is that plant um or at least a, a variety of it um, I think of it as a quintessential prairie plant. Um, it's a little bit taller, so um, it'll get about three to four feet tall. So it's it's great as, you know, kind of one of your background layers there. Um, it does like that fold apart sun and um, it tends towards the little bit drier soils, but these beautiful flowers you'll have in uh, late summer into early, um, early fall. Um, you know, hummingbirds, they're going to be passing through that time of year. Love this. Uh, the butterflies, bees. Um, and like we said, it's, you know, the, the birds will feed on in the winter and it adds a little bit of winter interest to your garden. So here's another one of our goldenrods, Riddle's goldenrod. Um, again, like these lovely yellow flowers and great color. Um, this one, um, unlike the um, the showy goldenrod we looked at earlier, this does a lot better in wetter locations. Um, so if you've got a place that um, isn't so dry, uh, this is probably going to be the goldenrod for you. It grows up to about three feet. It does like that full sun though, so you don't want some place that uh, gets too much shade. Um, it really needs that good six hours or more of sun um, through the day. Uh, like the other goldenrods, it blooms in the late summer into the early fall. And it is also considered a keystone plant in our area um, and host plant for butterflies. And now, Shamim, I want you to say the Latin name 10 times fast. <laughs> Olga Nera and Redelli. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is one of my summer favorites, wild bergamot. Um, you might know it as Minarda. There are a lot of um, cultivars of Minarda that you can find at the garden center. Um, I've got Minarda in my front yard and it is just nonstop action the whole time it's blooming. Um, it's a very popular nectar source for um, bees, butterflies. I haven't seen the hummingbirds here, but I know people who have. Um, it can grow two to five feet tall. Um, it just kind of depending on its conditions. Um, it does like that full sun, but will handle um, part sun. Um, it can kind of span that range between dry and moist soil, so it's really pretty adaptable. Um, and these are your summer blooms. Um, you'll get a little bit into September, but um, this paired with uh, any other yellow flower is just stunning. <laughs> and it's a I just oh, go ahead. Oh, th th that's it. <laughs> I just was going to add to this before I, I we switch over is mine bloomed heavily last year for the first time. I have two of them and I had these, I mean, I see bumblebees in my garden, a cu couple varieties every year, but all of a sudden on this plant, I was seeing these two varieties of really cool, different bumblebees than I was used to to seeing big, you know, bigger. And um, they were all over this plant for the few weeks that it was blooming. And then when they were done blooming, the the bees were gone. So I got this treat. So whatever it is, I mean, how they're, how they're finding this plant and then leaving, they never went on my other pollinator plants, like, like so many native plants, like so many others do. So they must be you know, really seeking out certain types of, of pollen and nectar, but it was, it's amazing how the more v variety you plant, how many more species can be drawn into your yard that are really looking for specific flowers. Yeah. Um, I need to pay more attention this season to see just who all is coming to visit, but it, it really, native plants are like Pokemon. You know, you can try to pick one of them, but you need to collect them all. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Golden Alexander and talk about Latin names. I've always really liked that Latin name, Zizia. Me too. <laughs> it, it's cute. Then it's a cute plant, and I, I see it coming up out in, 
in, in my garden. I have some in the front and the back, and I just I just love this. It's just so fresh. Um, it, it's covered in large, brilliant gold flowers, and it only gets to be about one to two feet tall. And um, again, it blooms in spring when everything is kind of fresh and new, and it's just a really joyful plant. Very easy to grow plant, and it's wonderful in great heavy. So if you have like really heavy clay soil and, and you just have a hard time with many plants, this one just loves that. And it'll grow in a wide variety of locations, whether it's full sun or even part shade. And it's um, it likes medium to moist, even to wet soil. So this is just a really adaptable, easy to grow plant, very low maintenance. It's a host plant for swallowtail butterflies. So swallowtails are one of the few butterflies who have successfully started being able to lay their eggs on a non-native variety of a plant. So carrots, dill, they are in the, the, the same family as golden alexander. Golden alexander was the original host plant of the swallowtails back in the the prairies of old, they have been able to, to successfully breed on, you know, carrots and, and, and dill and fennel. Um, unfortunately, most butterflies have not been able to, um, and moths have not been able to make that jump to, to a non-native plant. I will also say Golden Alexander is one of the native plants that I've somehow managed to keep growing in a pot for uh, about five years now. Wow. And so it's not even a very big pot. <laughs> So there, that's a great example. If somebody does live in a condo or a townhome and you have a patio and you want to put some native plants in a, in a container. Um, definitely one to give it a try. Yeah. All righty. Wild geranium. This is a great spring flower. Um, a beautiful woodland wildflower. So it will grow in... Um, you know, a lot of locations, it prefers part shade to shade. It'll probably grow in part sun. I wouldn't put it in full sun, but it definitely prefers it more on the shady side. It forms, it has very attractive foliage and forms nice small clumps, one to two feet tall. And this is a plant that would work great as a ground cover. If you have an area of trees, an area that's shaded, and you want to cover the ground with a plant that doesn't get very tall to try to prevent weeds from coming into that area, this would be a great plant to use. Great spring pollinator plant. I know I say this about every slide, but I just love these plants. I think these flowers are just so amazing. Talk about a work of art. So this is our native columbine. If you've been in, in, in you know, garden centers, nurseries, you may have seen some not or some cultivars of this plant, some purple varieties of this, or some solid yellow. I mean, this is this is a plant that they have done a lot of um, created a lot of uh, of cultivars of. But our native Columbine, which of course is the best, is this red and yellow color. It blooms May and June and only gets to be one or three feet tall. So, as we you can see, native plants are not all ten feet tall. You know waving prairie plants. This is a nice small plant that uh, is very adaptable. It can grow in dry to medium soil. So only, only the wettest of soils is, is going to be a problem for this plant. It can grow all the way from full sun to complete shade. Now, does it get more, you know, easy to get along with than that? And it attracts a variety of, of uh, pollinators. It's loved by hummingbird birds and it is a host plant for um, species of our butterflies and moths. Woodland phlox, here's another great ground cover for shady areas if you want to cover the ground with beautiful color in May and June and prevent weeds from uh, coming in. Only gets to be one to two feet tall. And I just today when I was out in the yard, I saw I got my first flower uh, on one of these, you know, it's full with buds, but the first flower opened today. Whoops, a daisy. The first flower opened today. Sometimes this thing just like kind of goes on its own. Um, let me go back to that one. 
now I'm getting, it's very sensitive tonight. Okay, so medium to moist soil, um, fragrant tubular flowers. And again, it's loved by butterflies, moths, and hummingbirds. Um, and it's also a favorite of the clear wing hummingbird moth, if any of you have ever seen that. I know I sound nerdy right now, but it really is a cool thing that you can see sometimes. It's it's technically a moth, but it looks, it hovers like a hummingbird, and it's a um, a moth that you'll see during the day. So cool. <laughs> All righty, so now we have sweet Joe pie. Now, sweet Joe pie is technically a cultivar of Joe pie. I will admit that. This is one that we add that's a cultivar because the straight species Joe pie can get to be 10 feet tall. We're not saying that if you if you don't if you have a place, the right place for a 10 foot tall plant, please go with the straight species Joe pie weed. But if you want, but this is such an amazing plant for pollinators that rather than not grow it, it's it's better to go with the cultivar that only gets four to six feet tall. And, and the cultivar of this particular plant has found to still be very attractive to pollinators. Um, again, it's a favorite of butterflies and other pollinators, and this will grow in partial to full shade in moist but well-drained soil. And now wild ginger, another wonderful heart-shaped leaf ground cover for those shady areas under trees and shrubs to prevent weeds and just form a, a lovely lush carpet of green. Um, it can, this can help fend off weeds and invasive plants. Again, it prefers part to full shade, medium to dry soil, and it too is a butterfly host plant. We're going to switch it up a little bit, and uh, we've got a few grasses that we've selected. I know we think of prairie grasses as being those tall, wavy things in the wind, but we've got some that will look great in your yard. Uh, the first here is little blue stem. Uh, not big blue stem, but little blue stem. So about two to three feet tall. Um, as you can see, it forms these really beautiful uh, clumps, um, you know, the kind of landscaping you see all over now that's just so popular. Um, it's got this gorgeous foliage. It's kind of a bluish green. Um, and it really does it really does form a nice mound. And in the winter time, um, fall and winter, you'll start to get that really like bronzy color. Um, so it's, I mean, it's just gorgeous all the way around. Um, it does not, however, love our super, super clay soils. It really likes a more, uh, well-drained environment. Um, it does want full sun, um, but it's a host plant for butterflies. And again, it's another one that's deer resistant. Um, kind of on the, uh, other end of the wet spectrum, <laughs> we've got switchgrass. Um, which actually doesn't mind those moist set soils so much. Um, it also forms these great clumps. It's a little bit taller. It can grow up to six feet tall. Um, as you can see in the picture, it um, you know you start to see those seed heads, and then the rest of it's going to follow with those gorgeous golden colors. Um, it does like the full sun, um, but it uh, it provides winter interest and the. Birds are going to love it. Uh, butterflies are going to love it. And it is also deer resistant. And one of my favorites, uh, prairie drop seed. I like to call these nature's tiny fountains. Um, they grow in these little clumps that kind of grow up and kind of flap over into these little, you, you kind of see in the picture, like this little fountain. So um, it, it grows two to four feet tall, but don't be freaked out by that four feet because when it throws up its seed heads, that's really the stalks that are the tall part. It stays more mounded to the ground. Uh, it does like full sun and that dry to medium soil. Um, so you'll you'll see that flower in um, August, September-ish. Um, it does have a very uh, unique scent um, and is a host plant for pollinators. And, um, you know, like a lot of these, we'll continue to feed the birds all through the winter. So we love the prairie drop seed. 
And this is another one where I want you to say the the Latin name 10 times fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let her off the hook. <laughs> Mike, I need my brain to wrap around that. They say, if you don't know how to say a scientific name, just go for it like you know it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, let's move into shrubs a little bit. So this is the red twig dogwood. Um, you can see both its flowering pictures on the right and look at those gorgeous stems through the autumn and uh, into the winter. Like this, this has it all. Um, the white flowers are loved by the pollinators. Um, it's got berries later on the season and it grows about six feet tall. So, you know, this is one that needs a spot, <laughs> that corner of your house or, you know, that little focal garden that you might have. Um, it likes the part to full sun in that medium to wet soil. Um, it can really deal with those, those wetter um, areas and is a butterfly host plant. And then we have winterberry, which is our native holly. So if you've ever wanted holly, this is the one for you. Um, it, it is not evergreen, but uh, it has these amazing red berries that will uh, stay on into the winter um, as long as uh, the birds, you know, haven't completely finished them off yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's got flowers in the early summer. And you'll see pollinators coming to check those out too. It does grow about six feet tall. And uh, you can put this just about anywhere though, um, unless you've got a super dry soil. It can do full sun, it can do shade, it can do those medium soils, wet soils. Um, it, it does it all. And it's a host plant for 34 species of butterflies and moths. It's pretty impressive. And the New Jersey tea. So I, again, like I love so many of these plants, but this one I think is is the perfect uh, little shrub to have like in front of your house because it only grows about two to three feet tall. So it's not gonna block your front windows. Um, it has these gorgeous flowers um, in July and August. Um, it is pretty drought resistant. Like it can deal with um, those drier soils as long as it's well-drained. So it doesn't like to keep its feet wet. Um, in fold apart sun, hummingbirds, pollinators, uh, it's a host plant. Uh, you can grow them in little clumps and make yourself a little low growing hedge. Um, it's just a, a really lovely and versatile plant. And one thing I wanna add to this one that I learned the hard way is that oh, yes. <laughs> rabbits, rabbits love, love, love this plant. So when you, if you, so I planted it a couple of years ago and during the winter they chewed it off to nubs. And um, this was the only plant they disturbed in my native plant that they disturbed in my garden, but they chewed it to nubs. This must be like the Snickers of the rabbit world. And, um, and then I was, I saw later in something that I was reading how much they love this and to, to avoid um, this, protect it from rabbits for the first two years until it gets tall enough and woody enough and then they'll leave it alone it's just those new tender green shoots that they mm -hmm. want so i i have um i did this the last two winters i have and it's coming up beautifully but so if you do plant this and it's and i wouldn't i wouldn't let that deter you because it's an amazing shrub but protect it a little bit from rabbits the first two years Good advice. So this is uh, vernal witch hazel. Um, if you are a fan of uh, forsythia, which is blooming right now, you'll see those little yellow flowers. Um, this is the perfect native alternative. Um, it also has yellow flowers. It blooms about this time of year. Um, it grows about the same height, that six to 10 feet that you might see with a forsythia. Um, but it's very tolerant of soils. So you can plant it in a wetter area, a drier area. Um, and it's one of those really early food sources for the first pollinators um, to either emerge or, you know, to get here in the spring. Um, it's also a butterfly host plant. And uh, like a lot of the others we've had here, deer resistant. So uh, I don't know about rabbits with this one, though. <laughs> Uh, 
And uh, here's common nine bark. Um, this is uh, this can be a larger shrub. Um, it can grow up to 10 feet tall, but it is just beautiful. There's so many things that make this such a unique plant. Um, you can see from the pictures, like it really fills out. It's got these gorgeous, like pinky white flowers um, in the early spring. And in the fall, you'll get yellow colors for it. And in the winter, it's got uh, the bark peels. And so you've got something to look at all through the year. Um, it also will tolerate, you know, if, if this is a bit too much plant for you, you can trim it back and keep it more as a, a neat hedge. Um, it can do full sun, it can do shade, everything in between. Um, so you, you've got a lot of versatility with this. Um, and it can do dry to moist soils too. It is loved by birds, butterflies, uh, all sorts of pollinators. And, uh, you know, like I said, it gives you something really all year round. This is Arrowwood viburnum. Um, I'm sure you've seen viburnum in the garden center. Um, this is one of our native varieties. Um, it's got these just super beautiful, delicate, little creamy white flowers um, that you'll see uh, later in the spring or early in the summer. Um, and then those will give way to berries, which we all know the love, the birds love the berries. Um, and in the fall, uh, you'll get that autumn color. So we've got these great shrubs that just give you really interesting um, variety for your garden all through the year. So this one grows about six to 12 feet tall. Um, it will do sun to partial shade. It does like moister soils, um, so it won't do well in a super dry place, um, but you know, you've got some options there. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be another little pollinator hotspot for your yard. An elderberry, which I want for my yard and I don't have yet. <laughs> <laughs> so this also has white flowers a little bit later. So um, June and July, um, it's got those really just it, like the texture of the leaves are just, mm, yeah. Um, and then its flowers also give way to purple berries. Um, I love elderberry. I had a chance to, uh, somebody made some jam and it was amazing, but you'll have to fight the birds for it because the birds are going to be all over it. <laughs> this one's a little bit smaller. It grows about six to eight feet. Um, it does like the full sun and it does best in those medium to moist soils. Um, it's, uh, it's another great shrub for your yard. And I just want to say, I think that it's the elderberry that I read about that you really need to cook the berries before you eat them. I believe that's true. Yeah. It looks so tantalizing right there, but I don't think you can just pull them and eat them in your garden. <laughs> we'll save that for the service berry. We'll get that. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, here's another one. I'm sure you've seen lots of hydrangeas at the garden center. Smooth hydrangea is our native hydrangea. Um, it does share a lot of characteristics that you probably um, know about them. Um, it's, you know, it's a shrubby plant, um, grows about three to five feet tall. Um, it blooms through the summer. Um, it does like that part shade. It will not do well in full sun. Um, it needs those moister soils. Um, otherwise you'll get the, ugh, wilts of the hydrangeas. Um, and then in the fall, you'll get those yellow leaves. And this one is rabbit resistant. Um, I know um, some of you are looking for that. I know we've got tons of rabbits in our neighborhood. Um, so this one is definitely should be on your short list of plants. And, and our native hydrangea, does not have those big poofy flowers that you see that you're used to seeing on hydrangeas. Right. Those poofy flowers were actually, I, I believe, like with the Annabelle hydrangea, they were kind of cultivated into it. I believe that this was the original native hydrangea, and they they cultivated it to have the big poofy flowers. And then the the red, the pink and blue ones, they came from somewhere else. They're not native. And really those poofy flowers are useless to pollinators. These flowers stay more um, flat um, and, and so, and, and, but yet there's pollinators all over them. Yeah, and that brings up a good point too. You know, we talk about the cultivars 
than the native ours. And from the reading I've done, the closer to the original flower in color and size and shape you can be, the better it is. Um, so mm. uh, because that's what you know our, our pollinators have evolved to to be with. They can't reach the food or it smells weird, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So smooth hydrangea. It'd be like us trying to imagine you're you're going to eat um, a piece of chicken or um, a piece of cheese and it's purple. <laughs> <laughs> you're not even going to recognize that as cheese. <laughs> All right, okay, I'll so some trees. Yeah, so now we're going to get into to some trees. So um, this is a dwarf chinkapin oak, and I know that they... They, you're not going to see these a lot of places. You're sure, certainly not going to find these in your garden center, but they do have them at Possibility Place Native Plant um, Nursery in Moni. And this is a great alternative. Let me back up and say oaks are king, king and queen. Oaks are king and queen. They are the, um, the number one keystone plant in our area. In fact, an oak is the host plant to more than 500 species of butterflies and moths. So the more oaks we can have in our neighborhood, on our property, the better ecosystem we're gonna have. Um, however, some of our smaller suburban yards and urban yards may not uh, have enough room for a large oak because most oaks do get pretty large. There are some varieties that don't get quite is large and, and, and would work for a parkway street. But if you would like to have an oak and you just really don't have a ro the room for a full-size oak tree, consider this dwarf chinkapin oak. It's kind of like an oak shrub, actually. Um, it only grows 10 to 15 feet tall, but yet it has all of the ecosystem benefits of a big, mighty oak tree. And it actually um, produces acorns at a much younger age than most oak trees. And as I said, this too will be the um, host plant to more than 500 species of butterflies and moths. And the red buds. So the red buds is, are starting to bloom now. And, and, you know, this is a tree that, that, you know, is a native plant that has, you know, crossed over and become a popular landscape plant. However, a lot of them are cultivars of the original Eastern red buds. So really you want to be sure that it says the Latin name Circus canadensis and it doesn't have any um any name and quotations, flashy name and quotations to be getting the 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 true native species. Uh this is just um you know a, a fantastic tree. I mean all is right with the world when the red buds are blooming, you know. It's one of the most beautiful spring flowering trees smothered in those pink blossoms. It grows to be about anywhere from 15 to 30 feet tall. This is an understory tree. So it's an understory tree in our forests. You will find it out in the forest preserves. And so therefore it does like part shade to shade. Uh, so don't put it in a full sunny place. Although the people across the street from me have two that are doing lovely on the west side of their house, go figure. But, but for the most part, keep it in in part shade to shade. It does like some moisture and um, it attracts birds and spring pollinators. And it is a fast growing plant uh, tree as well. It also, if you look at it close, it looks like the flowers are growing out of the branches. It's so cool. <laughs> And you know, sometimes they'll actually the, the flowers will grow out of the trunk too. Yeah. In this one. It's it's very cool. And the pads that it gets in the fall are really attractive as well. They look like pea pods because this is in the pea family. Yep. All righty. So here's another great native tree, uh landscape tree, small tree. Um, it's a service berry. Love that. They're they're kind of mine is just finishing blooming right now. Um, they have a very graceful, airy uh, form. They can either be a large shrub or they can be trimmed into um, a small single stemmed tree. 
Um, they for sure have four seasons of ornamental interest. The bark is attractive. The berries are amazing. The, the flowers are amazing. Um, the, they have delicate white flowers in April. Uh, when the berries come, they are just, I mean, in my yard, they're gone before they're even fully ripened because the birds just love them so much. <laughs> um, so this, I just love this plant. And, you know, in our other talk, uh, restoring our environment one plant at a time, we talk about, um, uh, you know, the problems with the calorie pear trees, they've become an invasive species. And um, so if this is a great alternative, if you want a nice, fresh, white flowering spring tree, go with the service berry. And um, this will take more sun. Uh, it'll grow in part shade, but it will take more sun than the red bud that we recently mentioned. It is a fun game to play right now as they're both blooming in the calorie pear and the service berry as you're driving through, which one's which? <laughs> You're right. The one that's the the the, the calorie pear is the one that stinks awful. <laughs> <laughs> it smell is awful. And then, of course, like I mentioned before, our mighty oak. If you have a you know large property or you have enough room for um, an oak tree, there's nothing that you can do um, better for our ecosystem than to plant an oak. And they will grow the different varieties. Will grow forty to eighty feet tall. Full apart sun, moderate moisture. We have 20 species that are native to our area. And again, um, this says 456, but I've actually read something updated that from Doug Tallamy that says more than 500 species of, of caterpillars. Yeah, oak trees are like the apartment complexes of our native. That's a good way to put it. That's a really good way, yeah. Okay, so all there are a few native maples in our area and these these are really important plants when they're flowering in the early spring for our early emerging pollinators sugar maple silver maple but a lot of people don't like those on their property they can be soft wood they can they can break they can um, just get way too big they can have aggressive roots but this is a native variety of our maple that is less um, problematic and gorgeous in the fall. I mean, look at that, that color, that color. And, 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 a, and again, a very important plant in our ecosystem. So it'll grow about 40 to 60 feet tall, uh, brilliant red fall foliage, and uh, it'll grow in sun to part shade. And this is a keystone plant in our area. And birch, I love birches too. And uh, I just heard today, I have a couple birch trees outside and the goldfinch are just crazy about the seeds on a birch tree. So every year in late April or through May, all I hear is flocks of, of, of goldfinch in my birch trees squeaking. I just love that sound. It's like the sound of spring here. And, and I heard the first one today up there. I'm thinking, oh, I guess there's seeds forming. Um, but it's an impressive native tree uh, known for its stunning bark. Some have peeling birch, um, peeling bark, some have gray bark, but just a very attractive tree even in the winter. Hardy and versatile, full to part sun. Um, our birch trees like some moisture, so they will grow in some wetter areas. Uh, 40 to 70 feet tall, they have great yellow fall foliage. And again, this is a keystone plant in our area and host for 274 species of caterpillars that we know about. The one caution I'll say about birch is it does like wet areas, but it does not like to have its feet soaking wet. Um, you'll tend to cut their lifespan short if it's if your soil is just not drained enough. Good point. Wonderful. All right. So I think we can all agree native plants are beautiful and many of them do look stunning in traditional suburban landscapes. In fact, you know, a lot of what we might find at the garden center came from our native plants. They're, you know, cultivars from what lived here. Um, and so we do want to plant them for their aesthetic value. We want to enjoy our gardens and be, you know, excited about how our yard looks, but we also need to plant them for their ecosystem value. 
um, we need to be part of the solution um, to be that place for pollinators to have shelter, to have food, to um, reproduce. So um, I love this quote from Doug Tallamy. In the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. So each of us is doing just a little bit can add up to a lot. Um, Homegrown National Park um, is a project of Doug Tallamy's. Um, it's a website that you can go to and you can actually quantify um, you know, the ecosystem that you've created um, with your native plants. And as you look out, as more people add their gardens, you can see um, that we're really starting to create new spaces for all of our, our native wildlife. So you're probably wondering, um, this is great, but where do I find these plants? Um, and that is a good question. Um, so you can go to our website um, and find a list of um, native plant growers. Um, you heard us mention Possibility Place. Um, we do get a lot of our plants from there, but they are a wholesale um, place. So you can only buy very large quantities from there. Um, but they do sell um, to a lot of the local plant sales. Um, as well as some of the garden centers in the area. Um, online, uh, Prairie Nursery and Prairie Moon Nursery um, are both good, reputable places to get plants. And it is spring plant sale time. Um, so the Illinois Native Plant Society is a place to go to check and see what plant sales are coming up um, close to you. And of course, um, we have our own plant sale coming up, which we will, of course, plug in. We'd love to see you there. It is June 3rd um, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Moraine Valley Community College. Um, we'll be there in the, I guess that would be the northwestern kind of area of the parking. Um, we will have over 4,000 plants for you to purchase. Um, so there will be uh, no shortage of choices, um, but get there early. <laughs> And we'll have plants, we'll have flowering plants, we'll have grasses, we'll have shrubs, and we'll have trees. So yeah, so make your lists and, and come ready to, to buy. And so uh, another quote from Doug Tallamy, we can each make a measurable difference almost immediately by planting a native plant nearby. Can anybody what? guess what native plant that is in the photo? This is where we have our quiz. <laughs> oh, they can't send us chat messages. <laughs> we'll just assume you guys all got it right. Well, that that looks like a prairie blazing star to me. Would you agree? I think that it is. Okay, so we do have a few questions. And that's a great... Uh, so you asked the question, are any of the plants rabbit resistant? So yes, they are. Um, and we're just putting on the website, probably as we speak, um, a list of native plants of Illinois that are resistant to deer and a list of native plants that are resistant to rabbits. So if you go on our website and you go under what you can do and then go down to become an ambassador, Mary, if you have a chance, if you wouldn't mind putting a link at least to the ambassador tools um, and go over to ambassador tools. It will be in there as one of the tools, a list of rabbit resistant native plants. And Dan asks, I have a Joe pie that is not in the best of places. Are they hard to move? I don't know that I have ever tried to move a Joe pie. I have not either. So the tricky thing with a lot of our, especially sun loving native plants is that they have those really deep root systems. And so once they are established in a place, it can be hard to transplant them. Um, that said, if you're thinking that you're gonna move it anyways, it doesn't hurt to try. Um, it's it's how we've we've learned a lot about what works for, you know, our our yards and our, you know, very specific locations. So to give it a go. Oh, and Gail did guess Leatrice. Good for you, hey. Gail. <laughs> um, 
Kelly asks, this is a great question, Kelly, for the shrubs that have berries, examples, arrowwood, viburnum, do you need a male-female plant combo in order for the plant to generate the fruit? So yes, and that, and I, I should have uh, brought that up for winterberry, absolutely. So winterberries, those ones that have the, the beautiful red berries in the, in the, fall and winter if the birds don't eat them the ones that you you go to the the garden center or the the you know uh big box store and you pay ten dollars for some branch with berries on it uh to uh adorn your front porch pot at christmas time um those are native holly those you do need a male to um for each 10 females to cross pollinate and they need to be the, the male needs to be within 50 feet of the females. Um, I know this because I have I have winter berries and I, I had to do this. I was getting the flowers, which are great and, and pollinators love it, but I wasn't getting one that uh fruited. And and so now I did plant a male and I'm trying and and you know hoping to get the the fruits as well. So that one you do as far as I am aware because I have a lot of these other shrubs as well. All of the other ones you do not that we mentioned today. Most you do not need the male and female. Would you concur, Shamim? Yeah, uh, it's not something I've run into with many of the species. Okay, Rose asks, are there any plants that should not be planted near each other? So there are, the plants that we talked about today tend to be um, not super spready. They don't get really aggressive um, with filling in an area, but it it is definitely something to think about, um, especially if you're choosing some, some that do tend to be a bit more that way is you don't want a plant that tends to just kind of keep to itself to be planted right next to something that likes to, to spread out. Um, because you don't want that to get overrun, especially if it's one that's going to kind of outshade um, and outcompete that a little bit. And I will add to that something that I learned that was kind of surprising to me, but, um, you know, sunflowers are just such an amazing thing for our, our ecosystem. The, the pollinators love them. And actually it's been found that the pollen of sunflowers is so is extremely nutritious to our native bees and it actually um, prevents them getting diseases because it boosts it has a, a an immune boosting um, effect on them uh which is very cool but it's also sun there's there's a chemical in sun in all parts of the sunflower that inhibit other plants around it from growing. And so just be aware of that. So what I've started, you know, so if you're going to grow sunflowers, have sunflowers in a place, don't try to grow other plants within them. You know, give them a section of their own. Um, are the oak trees you mentioned deer resistant? I think birch trees are not sure about maples. The truth is, is I don't think that oak trees are, are particularly, um, that, that deer are a, a real problem with oak trees, but um, a hungry deer will eat just about anything. You know, even, even if when we come up with a list of deer or rabbit resistant uh, native plants, if they're hungry enough, if they're starving, they'll, they'll eat almost anything. Um, you know, just like if we're hungry enough, we'll even eat a rice cake. But um, they they are, um, but that being said, if you live in an area that has a lot of deer, I probably would protect the trees during their first couple of years. Would you agree, Shamim? Absolutely. Um, and, and also, if you live near uh, a, a lake or larger body of water and you have beaver, that is also a reason mm -hmm. to protect your new trees. Uh, especially the newer trees, um, because uh, those tender shoots, man, everybody loves them. <laughs> right. Once once the tree gets bigger and the and the the trunk, the bark gets harder. Yeah. 
then then not so much of a problem. Is there a trick to getting leg plants started? I have just not been able to keep it growing. That's interesting. I know that it, 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 it's not tolerant to an overabundance of water and it really does like full sun. Yeah, um, mm. I have not started lead plant of my own, um, but I know some folks who have been able to su successfully grow it. Um, definitely in those first, you know, that first year or two, um, our native plants do need a little more TLC than they will for the rest of their life. Um, so, you know, like Kathy said, making sure that it's not overwatered, um, but if it's getting dry out, it, it will need some. Um, and I think lead plant is one of those ones, you know, a lot of times when we say a plant needs full sun, it will grow in part sun, but maybe not flower as heavily or maybe yeah. lean a little bit. But I think that lead plant really, really needs full sun. It really, really does love that full sun. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank, thank you, Gail. Thank you for a wonderful, inspiring talk. Wonderful. You are welcome. Thank you for being interested in native plants. Asters, talk about holiday pruning schedule. The thing I would say about asters is, is some of the things that, you know, we always say to, you know, try to leave your, your native plants up over the, um, over the winter for um, our birds to feed off of and to house any pollinators that are living within the stems. But the, the thing with asters, and that's a, a really good point, is sometimes people don't like how tall asters get, especially the New England aster. Sometimes it can get pretty tall and they can have a tendency to flop over. But if you cut it back, I mean, because it's a late blooming flower, if you cut it back uh, even as much as in half in late June, then you'll have a much shorter plant and it'll, and it'll flower still flower profusely because it doesn't start setting its buds till July. Yeah, that's a really good way to manage that. And don't fertilize it because it just encourages it to grow bigger. You know what? Don't fertilize any native plant. I don't think there's a native plant out there that needs fertilizer. They they nope. prefer no. Um, do you provide in-home yard consultations? Our yard has a wooded area also an area that gets flooded every spring and other areas that we would love to add native plants and also learn more about invasive plants that we should remove. Um, I don't know where you live. If you live in our area of the near west and southwest suburbs, uh, we do go and give a, um, we will come and give a consultation a site visit to members. And so become a member. It's $25 a year to support the SAG Moraine education and outreach mission. And, um, and we will come out if you are in our, in that area. And also if you're looking for somebody to actually, you know, create a design for you more than we'll come out and give you some general information about what kinds of plants might grow well in this area and this plant maybe you want to remove because it's a buckthorn. And so we'll give you some general ideas. If you would like an actual design created for your garden, that would be much more attractive than a design I would create. Uh, we do have some people that we can re recommend that will make a design for you. They can install it for you or they can just create a design and that they, they are listed on our website as well. But if you just want some general information, absolutely, we will do that. Uh, we recently planted, oh, so you live in Homer Glen. Yep, that's our area. Uh, we recently planted a white oak in our little forest. It's an open area with more space, but surrounded with other trees. You have mentioned that it needs full sun. Will it survive in the shady forest? Yes, the tops of it is is getting is is getting sun. Um, well, I see what you're saying. There's taller trees around it. They have a way. I mean, they they right, Shamim. They grow in the forest all the time. 
Absolutely. And when they're first growing up in the forest, they actually use that shade to their benefit um, because it's, I mean, they need enough sun to be able to, you know, produce all of the nutrients and things that they need. But um, that that shade and the protection from the bigger trees actually is helpful. Um, so as long as you've got a big enough space for it that when it grows up, it's going to get that full sun, it should do well. Okay, well, that looks like all the questions. I want to thank you all once again for coming. And, you know, please, we hope to see uh, you guys at the, the plant sale coming up in June or wherever you're you're getting your plants, or if you already ran out of room, kind of like me, and you don't have room for any more plants, happy pl happy garden season. And thank you for, for planting native. And thank you for your interest in planting native. If you want um, more information to help you this year, please join us for our next webinar, which is on is it May 2nd or May 3rd? It's Wednesday, May 3rd? I think it's May 3rd. It's Wednesday evening. Yep, May 3rd, yep. Benjamin Vogt, um, the author of A New Garden Ethic and uh, his recent book, Prairie Up. We're very excited he will be joining us, um, telling us how to start our native garden. So please uh, sign up through our website and join us for that. And thanks again. And thank you, Shamim. It was a pleasure. It was great. Thank you all for being here. Good night, everyone.